going to be EMOS. <laughs> Perfect. Very good. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, very good. OK. We can start here in just a couple seconds. And uh, excellent. Yes, very good. OK, well, let's kick it off. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Klassen, and I am the executive director of TMA Blue Tech. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to our monthly Blue Tech Global Connect webinar. Uh, today's topic is uh, the age of autonomy, swarm and drone tech. It's going to be a really, really cool topic today. So happy you're here. Uh, we've arranged for a fantastic um, panel. Uh, we have a moderator today is uh, Dirk Rosen. He's executive director from Marine Applied Research and Exploration, but short for that is MARE. Uh, today's uh, presenting companies will be uh, Alex uh, Dumas uh, from uh, uh, Berkeley Machine, Ro uh, sorry, Berkeley Marine Robotics. Then we have Founts Genese. He's a CEO and president of Unmanned Systems Operations Group, which is just USOG for short. And then we'll have uh, Phil Mengden. He's the uh, uh, director of business development for Swiss, uh, sorry, Swift Engineering. Um, before I hand uh, the, uh, the, uh, the moderation over to Dirk, and for those who do not know, just a little bit about TMA Blue Tech. Uh, we're located in San Diego and we're a nonprofit organization that promotes sustainable uh, science-based ocean and water industries. Our tagline is promoting Blue Tech and Blue Jobs. We are based on a triple helix model, which brings together academia, policy, and industry to further the cause of sustainable blue technology. Our three areas of focus are economic development, business uh, ecosystem development, and national and international outreach. Uh, just real quick, we have our 14th annual Blue Tech Week uh, conference coming up this year. It'll be November 14th to the 18th, and we'll be in person again this year. It's uh, one of the world's premier Blue Tech conferences where we'll be, where we bring together a fantastic array of high level professionals from around the world to talk about the state of Blue Tech today through the lens of academia, industry, and policy. Uh, this year, we have a fantastic agenda, uh, which outlines, you know, the absolute latest in blue tech advancements in a range of sectors. Uh, specifically this year, we're going to focus on uh, offshore renewable energy and sustainable commercial shipping, as well as a ton of other topics. So uh, if you want to keep abreast of those uh, developments, you can um, uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, I will put that uh, link in the chat box as well as uh, a link to uh, registration and just overall details of the event itself. Um, also know that if you're a, a TMA Blue Tech member, you do get free access to Blue Tech Week's uh, Summit and Expo, uh, which is on Wednesday and Thursday, Blue Tech Week, and that is a $600 value. You will also get the benefits of membership to the 12 month period of your membership. Um, I will put that information in the chat box as well. Uh, we're recording this webinar uh, for those who, of you who would like to reference uh, this webinar at a later time. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and we will put this video on our YouTube channel within uh, 24 to 72 hours of the conclusion of this event. Uh, finally, a few housekeeping topics. Uh, our presenters have about 10 minutes to present. Uh, at the nine minute mark, I will give a signal that one minute is remaining. Uh, other than this, uh, uh, Dirk will facilitate the discussion, the discussion, and especially the uh, the Q and A at the end, where we should have about thirty minutes for discussion. If you would like to ask a question uh, for our speakers, just write it in the chat box, and we will make sure it is asked during the Q and A. So, with that, I would like to hand the table over to Dirk from Mare. Dirk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'll attempt to share my screen now. Uh, can you see that? Yes, we can. Great. So uh, as Matt said, we're Mare, we're a, a nonprofit, and I'm going to talk about um, doing subsea work in the ocean. We have also um, some land-based companies as well, but there it might be a good analogy for uh, folks, whether you're working in the ocean or subsea. So um, let me get started uh, with some definitions. So in our world underwater, uh, there's mainly two types of vehicles being used right now, autonomous underwater vehicles or AUVs, and those are self-piloted. They're pre-programmed. Uh, computers are really the pilot on board, and there's no tether to a surface ship above. 
whereas remotely operated vehicles are powered from a, a ship above uh, via an umbilical that is bringing do down power and controls and then bringing back real-time video and other sensor data. In my world, uh, that's uh, we only have remotely operated vehicles, but I'm thinking about moving into the autonomous uh, vehicles, and I'll tell you why as we move through this talk. Okay, so the, the reason I started the nonprofit was having grown up in California, I saw precipitous decline in many species of uh, targeted recreational fish, not just rockfish, which is a delicacy here, but also salmon and some of our iconic species as well. So um, I started Mare to help really document who is living where in what numbers. And so, um, being a, a fish eater myself, I like to fish. Uh, it's just about having enough animals in the ocean, both fish and invertebrates, that we can harvest for future generations sustainably, wisely. So we built an organization um, that uh, does this work from soup to nuts. Uh, planning of any ocean mission is probably the most critical part and tends to get overlooked. But what we found was the better that we do uh, at planning, the better the mission goes. We always have an engineer offshore with us because the ocean never quits in trying to short circuit and flood equipment, um, brings all sorts of havoc. And uh, there are no hardware stores offshore. You got to fix it there. So lots of spare parts and know-how. Uh, the result is georeferenced analysis. We ad identify species, uh, hopefully to species level or critters down to species level and put them on a map. And, and then ultimately that goes into a giant queryable database where we can determine uh, things like associations uh, that a, say a fish has with certain type of habitat, certain temperature, certain latitude proximity with other fish that might be prey or predators, uh, that sort of thing. So um, when we started, it was just a couple of us engineers and we worked with Department of Fish and Wildlife's biologists. Now we have uh, nearly 10 marine biologists on staff doing that work for us. And we've been in business 19 years doing this, this work. And this is how we do it. This is just what we've developed is, um, we fly the ROV along the seafloor on a pre-planned path, we call it transect, and then uh, we collect all the video along the way, and that gets analyzed and processed into a number of things. First, what type of habitat is it? Soft, mixed, hard, because we'll tend to find different animals in each of those substrates. Then we place those animals where they live on the map and are able to draw those conclusions of who's living where. Um, when and then the real power of this work is is tracking change over time. So are things getting better or worse? So this is where we work. We don't uh, do much within the diver zone. Uh, we work in, with, within what I call the biomass zone. So we started 100 feet. We have a fleet of uh, six remotely operated vehicles. Uh, fiber conventional. One is a hydrodynamic tow sled that we tow. Uh, quite quickly along the seafloor for kind of rapid assessments called the batfish. And then um, our deep diving beagle ROV can go to about 2,500 feet. Uh, and that's where we stop. And then we leave the, the deeper stuff to things like Woods Hole and Scripps and Ambari here in California. So uh, AUVs have been coming for a long, long time. But also, so was deep sea mining, which uh, was eminent in 1980 and the reason I got into ocean engineering. In those days, it was manned submersibles that were carrying out the lion's share of the work. But uh, even with economies of scale and smaller uh, tethered systems, they, they were expensive. And fortunately, the Navy developed um, remotely operated vehicles in probably the late 70s, and they started to get reliable in the 1980s. And that's when I started in the early 1980s with a company called Deep Ocean Engineering. We built small observation class ROVs that might get up to 250 pounds and could dive to 2,000 feet. 
And those started to augment then replace divers for simple tasks. There's nothing that uh, will replace these hands. Um, our, the dexterity and sense of feel is, uh, is something that's very hard to replicate. Anyway, uh, late 1980s, we heard about autonomous underwater vehicles and they were gonna take over the world uh, next year. And it was always next year, next year, next year. And these are again, the pre-programmed robots uh, that do specific tasks. But ROVs continued to perform the lion's share of subsea work, uh, especially in nuclear reactors, offshore oil and gas, military work um, since the 1980s. But, you know, and I'm guessing, I'm trying to remember exactly when this was, but I would say around 1990, large AOVs started getting built and they were used for mapping and they had long duration batteries and they were spectacular. So you could put them down for days at a time. It was, uh, well, we don't know exactly what the Navy was doing, but I'm sure they were using them too for other things, but oil and gas saw an economy of using large AUVs to do huge swaths of mapping. And then now time is perfect for a whole new revol revolution in AUV technology that's far more sophisticated and is really being, in my opinion, driven by the drone uh, technology, aerospace uh, drones or non-diving drones, if you will. Okay, so uh, the future needs uh, for AUVs. And, and I'll give you an example. Later this month, we're doing, uh, this will be our third uh, project with NOAA where the, an AUV is sent out by day, maps the sea floor. That uh, information is analyzed the following day. And then the day after that, the ROV goes out and surveys with video all the areas of interest that were discovered by the AUV. AUV can cover a lot of territory. And so it's a great way to really pick and choose uh, where you wanna go perform your video surveys. So um, we only like to go where there's a map. If there's a map where um, we, we know our targets, if we don't have a map, we're blind and we're gonna see a lot of mud and sand. But uh, seabed 2030, uh, people's interest in their uh, exclusive economic zones, are driving countries, sovereign nations to want to inventory their waters. Uh, the shelves and shallow is certainly where the biomass lives. The deep sea is lucrative. Uh, that's where you'll find in some places, uh, you've heard of manganese nodules and polymetallic sulfides. Um, I think the pilot programs are going to start in earnest in a couple of years. Uh, hopefully they're pilot and well monitored to see what ramifications there might be, but it's being driven by our need for battery technology. And yet the most precious resource of all might be deep sea corals and sponges. They can live for thousands of years, they can heal themselves, and they've already made their way into pharmaceuticals for fight, fighting cancers and for use as anti-inflammatories. Uh, the AUVs can certainly map those EEZs right now. And that information can be used to identify the areas of special interest that should uh, warrant further uh, evaluation. Um, AUVs, I think, given uh, improvements in battery technology, uh, lower lighting, uh, better imaging systems should be able to video the seafloor before too long. And with long duration batteries, uh, I, I see the AUVs as the solution for deep sea long-term monitoring. Um, that would be uh, outfit with a whole sensor package for turbidity, um, toxic metals and so forth that might get uh, shot up into the water column. So again, this is what we do. We're just trying to help uh, a sustainable ocean. And I, conclude my remarks and really look forward to the next set of speakers. Let's see if I can unshare here. Did I do that? Yep, sure you have. Thanks, Fonz. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Dirk, if you could uh, continue on and uh, introduce uh, Founts or uh, Alex, that would be great.
Sure. Um, uh, I am privileged to introduce Founts Genese, and uh, he's going to talk to us um, about um, more aspects of drones. And I'll let you take it, Founts. <laughs> Thanks, Dirk. Uh, one really interesting fact is the large uh, AUVs you were talking about. Uh, Eco, I don't know if you're familiar with Eco Voyager. Um, I sent you the link. Uh, that's uh, my chief engineer's. That's his baby. One of the largest uh, UUVs ever built for the, and it's a program of record with the United States Navy. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. And good morning, everybody. Uh, first off, thanks to uh, TMA Blue Tech. Uh, you guys at the onset of USOG, Unmanned Systems Operations Group, um, you guys were there for us and uh, you gave us space in your incubator and you really helped kick off uh, my company. So thank you so much. And I'm really uh, glad to be part of this uh, group here. And thank you for allowing us to speak. Uh, my name is Founce Genese, as mentioned. And let me just do a quick background. Um, computer geek, computer nerd, musician, and love all things outdoors. But what really stands out and what allowed me to do this is uh, I'm a former audio engineer and, and systems integrations at Disney. And then I was also uh, flew medevac for the United States Air Force for a full career. And those two passions and parts of my life came together to start USOG. I was sitting on the five freeway going nowhere fast and saw a LabQuest van in front of me and my medical brain kicked in and said, hey, those lab samples are gonna go bad. Oh wait, I could have taken a drone, dropped off the stuff five miles down the road and come back within the time I moved 15 feet. We all know how traffic is on the five freeway north. Uh, so that's kind of what the impetus for USOG and it was all about saving lives and medical. And since then we've developed uh, multiple platforms in order to, uh, to help drones do all kinds of things. So we enable the safe, secure, and cost-effective delivery by drone for medical, e-commerce, disaster relief, food markets, and even sensor arrays uh, and, and things that we don't even know we can do yet. You know? So for all of you who are really technical-minded, this next slide's for you. So you, I can really explain to you what we do. We make drones carry stuff. And you can quote me on that one. <laughs> So um, let me kind of explain to you what we do with a little uh, narration and, and video of uh, a project we did with uh, Purdue, at Purdue University. And let's see if we get this kicked off. Oh, there we go. Um, essentially what USOG does is we develop end-to-end -end drone delivery platforms designed to offer fully automated and frictionless, frictionless package uploading and downloading. So we can upload and download and exchange packages where it's simple and easy. Um, we also develop and sell the hardware and software for drone delivery systems. Uh, we have the ability to do a broad range of payloads to service, like I said, e-commerce, food, medical, DOD, uh, disaster relief, and commercial markets. And this enables customers to operate and scale drone logistic networks uh, for transporting goods. Oops, next slide. There we go. And why did we do, why did we decide to do this? The problem. Um, ever since COVID and, and the way the world has changed um, and to include climate change, um, there's a need to deliver goods faster. And that growth of demand um, has exacerbated drone logistics and allowing drones to become ubiquitous and part of our everyday society. Just like when cell phones first came out, people are like, why would I use a cell phone? I've got a, um, a pay phone on every corner. Well, now everybody has a cell phone in their pocket and nobody ever sees. Uh, I don't know the last time I saw a uh, pay phone anywhere. And so the world is changing and that's what we're seeing in the drone industry. Um, currently, drones only carry one payload at a time, which limits the scale, delivery options, and the customer experience. And I uh, like to look at this in the sense of, your postal service person doesn't go to the post office, bring your mail, drop it off, go back to the post office, and then come back to your neighbors and deliver their mail. That's just inefficient. And so we saw that as a problem as well. 
And the other thing is, in the picture, you note that this is a, a delivery mission about to go off by another entity where the operator has to get down, load up the package, send it, and then maybe on the receiving end, the uh, client who's receiving it doesn't have to touch the drone. Well, in a lot of cases, the drone has to land and people do still have to, or there's just a tether that drops it off by gravity. Well, that's also a problem because not everybody um, follows safety rules and like to walk into things like spinning propeller baits and hurt themselves. So we're trying to remove those elements uh, and make things safer. And what's the solution? The solution is like we sh I showed you in the video is an end-to-end -end value chain where you can take uh, a delivery package, you put it in a box, it, uh, it goes to the drone, drone goes to the other end, drone delivers it out of a box. Um, I don't know many people who have hurt themselves opening up an Amazon delivery box. So I'm thinking that's pretty safe nowadays. Um, but I do know people who walk up to drones that are still spinning with propellers that have hurt themselves. So we're trying to take this and make it as safe as possible. What's the benefit to the retailers? It's accurate. Um, we're using AI, machine learning, automation. Um, we can use variable package configurations. It's safe, it's reliable, and we can scale this. And so how does USOG do this? Well, we offer multiple delivery systems. And as you hear, see here on the left, uh, we have a multi-package delivery system, which allows uh, one drone to carry three packages. And these three packages are about five to six pounds each. And these are large scale commercial platform size drones. So you figure about the bed of an F-150 is the size of this drone, okay? So we can go to three locations in one mission and deliver, uh, which allows it to be more efficient and more cost-effective. We did the math. One drone, uh, dropping off one box, you're losing money. Two boxes, you're breaking even. Three boxes in one mission, now you're making money. Uh, we also offer a smart tether system. Of course, you've seen tether systems on the, in the industry and they're ubiquitous. But with ours, it's a smart tether. We have bi-directional communication along that uh, tether line or winch line where we can put sensors, uh, mechanical claw, cameras, and whatever. So we can use radiological sensors to sense things. We can actually manipulate uh, and uh, claw at the end of it to pick up and release things. So it's very unique in the industry and it, all our stuff is patent pending. Um, we also have a pizza delivery box. We can affect night missions, as you see in the bottom left. We have a mobile platform for disaster relief, uh, disaster relief, which is in the pickup truck. And the top right is one of uh, my favorite clients is the American Red Cross. We can move 12 units of blood, seven pounds of ice, and that big old box, which comes up to about 20 pounds. And we can effectively move blood, medication, um, plasma, what have you. Um, in the time that it takes to move that same box by in congested traffic, four miles, one hour, we can do it in less than 15 minutes. So we're about saving lives and drone logistics. Um, we've got traction in the market. We're working with the American Red Cross, like I said, uh, Sprite Drones, Antex, Coastal Warrior, which is a big DOD alphabet soup entity, uh, will be showcased in again. Uh, this year, and we've worked with the lights and demoed for Papa John, and we work with Valkyrie, who's uh, one of our uh, drone box delivery companies. Uh, so we're really in the industry, and we're making things happen. Um, eight patents, nine trademarks, uh, be with between software processes and customer interfaces, and we've got another, actually now about eight other patents in the pipeline, and um, we're here to make all the other drone companies look good. We help facilitate and all our systems are drone agnostic and we also do bespoke solutions um, this is my amazing team love every single one of them i wouldn't be here today the company wouldn't be here today without all of them and uh, if you want to reach out and you have questions for us it's easy to find me usog.us there's my email reach out to me anytime and we're looking forward to any questions you may have and i think i nailed 10 minutes right on the dot <laughs> <laughs> well done founts you did congrats thank you <laughs> good job uh, <laughs> all right let me undo
things. Did I unshare my screen? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks, um, Bounce. That was fantastic. Um, Thank you. So uh, next up uh, is Alexander uh, Imas with Berkeley Marine Robotics. And I'm partial just because uh, he's going underwater. All right, Alexander. Yeah, I'll take on now. Thank you. Thank you, Farns and Dirk, for the very interesting talk. Um, so let me share my screen. All right. Um, so yes, yeah, so, uh, hi everyone. So I am uh, Alex Imas, CTO and co-founder at Berkeley Marine Robotics. And so today I'm going to present you um, our automated ship hull inspection system uh, that we are developing to provide the maritime industry with high frequency visual data on ship hull biofouling to improve um, the management of biofouling by the industry and therefore support uh, maritime decarbonization. So ship hull biofouling is an age old problem. It has always been there. Uh, there are, so biofouling is this growth of bioorganisms on weighted areas. It can be microorganisms like slime, it can be grass, algae, or it can also be macroorganisms uh, like tube worms, barnacles, mussels, uh, even crabs uh, can be there. And biofouling has a negative impact on the greatest challenges of the 21st century. Uh, on one side, biofouling is going to increase the drag of ships. And therefore, ships are going to emit, to, co to consume more fuel and therefore to emit more CO2. On the other side, these species can get attached on uh, one port and can then get dislodged at another port. And these non-native species can become invasive at certain location and completely change the ecosystem. Another impact on local ecosystem is uh, the release of biocides, because so to slow down the growth of biofouling, um, there is a coating, so paint added on, on the, on the on ship hulls. But when you clean the ships, you're going to release this paint in the water. And this paint, of course, is toxic because its goal is to kill species. So you're going to contaminate ports water with biocides like copper, zinc, every time you clean a ship in water. And so today it's a very hot topic because on one side we have the international maritime organizations that has set ambitious goals for the industry to curb down um, the emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases uh, for the maritime industry. Um, you, we have states like California, Australia, and New Zealand that have enacted strict regulation on invasive species, basically stating the ship hull must be cleaned. Um, before getting into their ports. And you can also see ports worldwide enacting regulation about cleaning and basically specifying that everything that is rubbed off the hull must be captured. And therefore that makes cleaning a very, very complicated and lengthy task. And in this problem, the main issue is there is no good way to track biofouling. The main way to do it is still to send divers. And so to address this need, we are developing an automated hull inspection system that combines three technical bricks, uh, autonomous robotics, swarm control, and wireless laser communication. And we are building a swarm of five unmanned underwater vehicles to scan Panamax ships. So the unmanned underwater vehicles or UUVs are man portable. They weigh around 20 kilograms or 40 pounds. Um, they can be autonomous, but with live feedback, so we can see in real time the data being acquired. Um, the operator can take control at any time if it wants to inspect special area of the hull. Uh, and our goal is that they will work without tether, uh, thanks to our laser communication technology. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, so Dirk already touched base on that, on the different UUVs available today. So commercially, today you mostly have remotely operated vehicles or autonomous underwater vehicles. 
Um, and for Earth technology, we actually are working in the category in between of semi-autonomous hybrid vehicles, which are very, there are very few of them commercially available. Are, it's mainly uh, a research topic and the most notable developments uh, have been made at uh, Woods Hole. And so therefore we are developing these semi-autonomous capabilities for, for our UUVs. So our company um, is, uh, so we are an early stage startup per, per revenue. Uh, and we are the result of uh, NSF funded basic research at UC Berkeley and customer discovery uh, also funded by NSF that we realized um, myself and, and Sushil who is the CEO of the company. Uh, so when I did my PhD at, at UC Berkeley, we received this grant uh, by the National Science Foundation to explore um, this concept of swarms of, of man-portable UUVs um, that can communicate using optical frequencies to relay a signal from the bottom of the ocean to the surface to facilitate ocean exploration. Um, a few years later, we got a second grant to explore the potential commercialization uh, of this technology. And that's where we realized that there was an urgent need of um, a new tool to acquire data on, on ship health. So during this customer discovery, we talked to more than 150 uh, potential customers or like players in, 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 the, blue, in the blue economy. Um, so these are competitive grants um, awarded after strict merit-based review. And our work currently is supported by a third grant by the National, Fund National Science Foundation and uh, SBIR award. Um, recently, we carried out field tests of our system prototype in Long Beach in California with commercial diving companies. So you can see on the left our uh, prototype being uh, launched in the water. Um, so we have a, a rig uh, that we use to launch the UUVs and a swarm of two UUVs at this stage. We are using the blue ROV2 as baseline for our prototype. Um, we are adding as a software that includes autonomous capabilities and swarm capabilities into it, as well as our laser um, communication systems that you can see on the side of the blue ROV2. Um, at this stage, we are still keeping the tethers for safety, uh, but, but our goal is to uh, remove them completely once the technology has been um, more tested, that we have more uh, results, uh, experimental results with our, with our technology. So the laser systems um, enable high bandwidth wireless communication. Uh, so it's basically up to 10 megabits at this stage. So that's much higher than any of the acoustic modems being used today in water and very similar to um, an Ethernet communication that you are using at home. Um, it also provides uh, accurate positioning of the UUVs. Uh, with the system, we can get positioning of, let's say around like 10 centimeters, something like that accuracy. Um, in these systems, we have, um, so for, for a communication link, we need to have one system at each side of the link. Uh, and the system has a pointing acquisition and tracking capabilities so, so that uh, the lasers always look at each other, each other. And we're doing this work because all the wireless communications that we have in the air that we're using uh, you are probably using now like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cell phone, GPS, all that use radio waves and are heavily absorbed by seawater. If you put your cell phone on the water, you will see that you will lose service very, very quickly. Before this test in, in Long Beach, we um, realized the first test in, in Sacramento where we wanted to test our, our swarm capabilities and make sure that we could uh, acquire biofilling data on, on the hull um, in challenging environments. So we scan the hull of this uh, 100 foot long boat. Uh, it has a flat bottom. Um, the water was highly turbid um, and there was really no light uh, below the hull. Uh, there was also a strong current uh, in there. And so we use the two UVs to scan the hull and you will see um, an extract on the left. So unfortunately, the quality is not great because of compression of Google Slides. Uh, so you see here 
the scan starting along the bilge kill, um, so it's a video captured by one of the UUV. So we can scan the hull very fast like that. Uh, and um, in the raw video, the quality is actually really good and we can assess the type of falling and the amount of falling. Uh, in this case, there was some grass uh, on the hull. Okay, so uh, right now we are finishing our demonstration phase and transitioning to our next phase of commercial pilot with diving companies. Um, it will help us generate revenue early. And we are also working on securing strategic par partnerships for um, our next phases. Um, we are seeing interest by floating companies who want to be able to track um, the performance of their coatings and therefore be able to provide better products to their customers, so the shipping companies. Um, we're also seeing interest by a few shipping companies who want to improve um, their hull performance management. And we believe that more and more shipping companies will be interested by this technology as, as CO2 regulation uh, impacts their business model. All right, thank you very much for, for listening. I will. Uh, Stop here. All right, this is Danielle Muller from TMA Blue Tech. I'm just chiming in. Um, I did, I'm just gonna tell everyone that if you have any questions, um, you can place them in the chat and I'll be happy to add them to our document. We'll get those questions answered um, once our presentations have concluded. Okay. Where's Dirk? Dirk, would you like to introduce uh, Phil? Uh, yes. Uh, our batting cleanup is Phil Menden with uh, Swift Engineering. They uh, do turnkey, I think, custom solutions for to challenging engineering problems. So go ahead, Phil. Perfect. Thank you all. I'm sorry I had to jump on a little bit late here. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, let me get my screen shared. All right. Okay, so I'm here to talk a little bit about our subsidiary Swift Tactical Systems and a program that we're doing and how that relates a little bit about uh, drone and swarming. So Swift Engineering started about uh, 35, over 35 years ago in 1983, and we actually were a product development company and also doing build to print activities. And we've worked on anything from manned vehicles, unmanned vehicles, fixed wing, uh, blended body, helicopters, multi-rotors, uh, you name it. We also actually worked a lot on uh, vehicles and uh, a lot of underwater and space vehicles also. And, you know, uh, they just mentioned the Echo Voyager. It's funny, we actually helped do some design and the full fabrication of that first Echo Voyager and also work on the ORCA program to date. Um, so it's uh, a little interesting how there's a lot of cross uh, cross industry people in different companies sometimes. But the big focus and what I'm talking about here is Swift Engineering ended up spinning off our subsidiary Swift Tactical Systems using SBIRs, product development, internal uh, funds to create uh, systems that we provide to our customers. In addition, we also have uh, distribution efforts that we use with our, our company. So. I was going a little bit slow when I try to click through my next slide. Sorry about that. Um, so what we did is we spun off our subsidiaries using those products. Another one was HyperKelp, where we focus on maritime service buoys. And all of those are going to be applied into uh, what this program that I'm going to talk to you all about. So keep in mind, when I talk about drones and swarming, I'm not talking about swarming of 1,000 or 10,000 Intel drones, you know, doing light shows and doing that, or potentially what the Army is talking about with, you know, potentially militarizing some of these drones and using them in that sense, when also integrating with a ton of different ISR aircraft. We do that, but what we're talking about here is a little bit smaller rate, but doing cross swarming between uh, aerial vehicles, surface uh, sensors and vehicles, underwater vehicles and uh, people, because uh, people also forget that people are part of that swarming for when it comes down to operations and human and machine teaming. So what we did here is what we're, we established academy, we're providing operational and training services 
for uh, this government and all the people we're working with. We have a ton of different um, aircraft. Uh, some of them are SWIFT products, some of them are not SWIFT products. And we're helping the Bohemian Nation set up a center of excellence down in the Caribbean using uh, unmanned systems. So right now we operate out of Nassau uh, mostly, but we've been in Exuma, Ragged Island, and Nagua. And again, you can kind of see the variance of the different products that we are, are using in these areas. So we have anything from aerostats, blimps, uh, quads that come out of boxes, uh, gas-powered UAS that flies for 14 plus hours, RO-21 VTOL for two hours, uh, surface sensors, underwater uh, vehicles, and uh, additional extra quads for and hexes. So I'm going to get into a little bit about what we've done. This is just the academy. So we go through basic uh, screening. We go through fundamentals, then intermediate, and then basically advanced. And not everyone will learn to uh, operate every single type, right? Uh, and some people don't need to. So we're working, you know, for example, with the Royal Bohemian Defense Force. They're going to operate probably every type of vehicle. Now, when you come down to the prisons, they really only need something like the aerostat or the or the hex to chase after something and or to put a blimp up in the air and monitor their perimeters, right? So those are the ways that these people are using these different products in different scenarios as we go through. And so some people may get training on everything, some people may not. Um, different mission sets. So a lot of the times we uh, fly around the harbors uh, doing investigation of boats coming in and out, uh, monitoring any of the ISRs, uh, aircraft, um, any of the other aircraft or vehicles that are operating outside of the bases, um, as well as monitoring some of the people and the politicians and the military personnel uh, as they move around the islands. Um, some of the blimp footage here, so you can see in this instance, you have day night activities, white hot, black hot, uh, daytime EO. And so all of that is operating and monitoring the uh, the parking lot around the prisons to make sure of any, you know, suspicious activities as they come by. Um, in addition, we've integrated to a software system called Shot Spotter. So what that system does is they have a base operation where all of these things go. Uh, we integrate all of the uh, all the communications back into this one hub. All of that is then also dispersed to the different ground control stations of the actual sites that we are at and how they're communicating back. So in the instance of the Shot Spotter. What that does is if it senses someone shooting a gun, uh, automatically that is pinged back to uh, this operation center. They are able to triangulate where that came from and you can see the hex uh, box and the UAV goes flying out of there and goes directly there to get on, uh, eyes on site as quickly as possible while communicating back to the police force um, as they go investigate as well. We do a lot of maritime operations, obviously. Um, it's the Bahamas, they've got tons of islands. I didn't even realize how many islands are really down there. So uh, there's a lot of activity uh, going in and out. But one of the major things that people do for the harbor and immigration is scanning the holes of boats. And then this instance, you can see there that uh, we were a little late, uh, but we, you know, there was some suspicious activity recorded and of, of a boat and how it was performing. And so we went out there and we were able to identify that the something was tied down to this boat, um, whether they did it or someone else did, you know, obviously that's up in the air. Um, but we were able to find it. Unfortunately, it had already been cut off and, and it was gone. So those types of things, uh, they weren't able to do this before. And so when we provided these uh, products to them, they are now capable of really understanding and seeing and, and noticing these things that are leading to the suspicious activity and then using aerial vehicles along with underwater vehicles to go investigate that suspicious activity. Um, in this instance, we went out and did, we did a lot of island operations. You can see it's really hot out there. So we kind of had to build our own little uh, tent for our people while they were operating or else it was too hot, but beautiful water. But you know there are a lot of illegal immigration. There's a lot of drug trafficking. Uh, so they you know, constantly have to go through the different islands and monitor and see what's out there. Um, and, and they wouldn't be able to do that before. They'd get to one side of the island, then have to walk all the way down to the other side. Now we pop up different UAVs and fly either the entire island, multiple islands at once. Uh, you know, they never sometimes have to even get off the boat sometimes. Uh, this is another uh, item where we did find a lot of migrants. Um, so we set up a, a joint team with the RBDF, the R RBPF, and our, our company, as well as the immigration forces. Uh, we got quads and hexes into the air, as well as our SWIFT VTOL. 
And, you know, we, we met with about 30 of their personnel as they went and investigated the migrant camp that we had. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, swarming isn't necessarily a thousand drones, it could be one, two, three, four, but you're also using people in this sense um, a whole lot. And uh, lastly, just some commercial applications. So natural disaster relief, uh, monitoring landslides, monitoring geomatic surveys, uh, looking at your barriers on the ocean for hurricanes, uh, those types, you know, the seawall type applications. So we do a lot of those oil spills with oil refineries after damages, a lot of disaster and damage relief investigation. Uh, so it's a, it's a very big operation. We're here to do a mission which is solve a lot of problems with a lot of different systems not just one so hopefully i'll get an idea of, of what we're doing but also how we're doing it and how that relates to uh, drone and swarming i believe that is uh everything i'm looking forward to y'all's questions excellent thank you very much um Dirk, do you want to uh, lead this uh, Q&A session here? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? We can. OK, so we have lots of good questions. Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, there was uh, a dozen questions to all of us uh, presenters and then some specific ones to individuals. So I'm going to start with uh, the general ones. I'll read, the, I'll read each question, and then let's go in the same order. Um, if we can have uh, first uh, Founts, then Alex, then Phil answer, then we'll move on to the next one. Uh, we'll have to be pretty tight in our answers, okay? Okay, team? So um, first off, uh, is uh, what challenges do you face regarding adoption of new technology? At least for us, uh, we don't want to be on the cutting edge. We want it to be fully developed. Uh, before we take it on, but uh, we have gotten quite interested in uh, bringing AUVs into our workforce, and our challenge is going to be uh, learning how to use them. It's a, it's going to be a different skill set. Bounce. Um, I think for uh, our sector, it's the education of companies and entities, and showing them the benefits of what drones can do for them. Yes, they get that drones can deliver. Um, but they don't know how to implement it yet. So we have to educate them on how to do it for them to see the full value of what UAVs can provide for them. Um, yeah, I will second on that on what, what Farn said. I don't uh, basically meet the same uh, type of, of issues. I would say for us, um... If we're talking about how we integrate a new technology into our systems approach, in that sense, um, we definitely have not, you know, everyone's product is different, has different items. So the most, the most difficult is getting those things to talk and talk efficiently. Uh, and that's, that's going to be your hardest challenge down there. How to do that is obviously a very broad topic we could talk about for days. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, that's one of the things we do is we try to get everybody to talk together since we're systems integrators, but everybody's a little different. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to have drones talk to ROVs, and I was successfully able to do that. It's just not a universal thing. Okay, the next question is uh, similar, but on the human side, what are your workforce needs? Does one need to have advanced degrees to work at your companies? Do you find that there are things we can do today to ensure that you have the workforce you will need for the future. Um, in our case, we have uh, two uh, paths of workforce, ne workforce needs. One are engineers to keep everything running and to try to um, update our equipment as, as we can. So we have an engineering path, uh, advanced degrees are not required. And then on the marine biology side, uh, we do a lot of analysis. And so uh, half of our people have masters. We don't have anybody with a PhD at this point. We usually partner with a, a friendly university. Uh, Founts? Oh, wow. Uh, one of the things that we, we do is we go back into the community and we give back. And we hold STEM workshops and weekend programs 
uh, to introduce uh, kids from basic electronics to actually building and flying kind of those pre-made drones. Uh, so we help foster that uh, STEM awareness in children. And uh, hopefully they become the future pilots, engineers, and programmers of the future. Will we need uh, UAV pilots? Yes, we will, but not as much as we're going to need programmers, engineers, uh, and the like, because this is all going towards full autonomy, as we're discussing here. And do you have to have a degree? No, you don't. Is it, a, is it better off for you to have a degree? Yes, to show that the discipline to, to make whatever happen. Um, but you can jump in and learn all the skills you need to right now via the internet. Do you want to know GIS? Do you want to know coding? Do you want to learn drone programming? Do you want to understand all aspects of the drone industry, 3D printing? Yes, you can learn and begin utilizing those skills right now as, as well while you get a degree. So um, to jump into this industry, you just need to have the, um, the heart, the drive, the passion, and to do a lot of self-learning and then also get a formal degree and or uh, mentorship with a company like one of these here. So in our case, so we have a limited workforce, of course. Um, for now, so it's mainly um, uh, masters and, and PhD, given as the challenges we have, which are mainly R&D. Uh, but we are, as the technology matures, and we want it, we want this technology to be able that can be used by basically anyone without any special qualifications. Um, so there will be more and more opportunities um, for um, engineers, for technicians. Uh, as we move forward with our full test and, and technology developments. Yeah, I'd say for, for us, we're, we really look for experience. Um, you know, some of the things that we do are very complicated. Um, and for us, the more experience you have, the better. And so that doesn't necessarily mean as experience as in a PhD or a degree. It means on hands experience and actually being out in the field, knowing what's going on, being able to understand the problems that those people are having because you've experienced it before yourself too. Um, and usually that comes with, you know, kind of as Farn said, um, you you do it as soon as, as a, someone as early as elementary school and getting them interested in math and science and having them play with Legos and programming Lego cars to go do things at young ages. And then as that works up, you know, the more hands-on stuff, going into shops, building things, getting, getting that type of stuff, but definitely looking on a, uh, on engineering side, software, electrical, mechanical, any anything, aero, any of that, we'll need it. Um, we also, you know, we kind of forget about this, but business development and marketing people are extremely essential. Um, you know, the UAV world is now becoming very large. Uh, the unmanned system world is becoming very large. And getting yourself out there in front of people is the most important thing. Just being visible to people and, and noticing, I think, is important. So having those marketing and business development people are also uh, pretty key, too. Thanks, guys. So I'm going to add to my answer, um, having heard you. Uh, one of the things I failed to mention was that we like multidisciplinary people, and uh, just about everybody in our organization goes offshore, works on ships. Um, if you've worked on ships for any length of time, it's a challenging environment. Uh, we, we just got back from a job in the Gulf of Mexico where um, we weren't used to 100 degrees and temperature and 100% humidity, but uh, that plus working on a ship with 15 other people in close quarters is, is quite a challenge. I mean, COVID notwithstanding. So um, that's the adventurous side, but it really, you have to have other skills as well. Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, next questions. I'm going to combine two that are very similar. Who are the main customers of the product services uh, of the presenters? And what are the most exciting opportunities that are emerging and which of the market sectors you're, you mentioned are you getting the most interest? So uh, for us, it's typically been resource managers that we work with. And now the most interesting opportunities coming our way are international. So we're starting to work in sovereign nations that have an interest in inventorying and managing their own oceans. In some cases, we're trying to democratize that so to train them how to do it themselves instead of listening to people from the United States about what they should or should not do. So, Founts? Oh, 
That's a good one. Um, our systems are being used internationally and uh, we have a great opportunity that we're currently in with the uh, American Red Cross, which is one of my ultimate dream clients coming from a medical background. And then in addition to that, um, our client, our, our main client is all the drone operators out there because uh, we, we, we serve a very specific niche. Um, we look at a drone like a pickup truck. You can get a Ford, Chevy, whatever pickup truck you want. But with that pickup truck, you can put a tunnel cover on it. You can put a camper shell on it. Um, heck, you can put uh, those A-frames to put ladders or glass and windows on it. And we service a very unique area where we're the company that makes the end client look good. So whatever your platform is and whatever that uh, you want to make it do, we allow your UAV to do that to include sensor arrays, moving multiple packages, whether it's for a pizza box or disaster relief, or to run sensors for sensitive areas. Um, we also have uh, a lot of opportunities with the DOD space, and we have clients that I don't even know who they are in a good way. So that's yeah. where we're at. We, we, we're in that fine, defined niche of we make everybody else look good, and that's what we do. So, so for us, so in, in the short term, it's uh, commercial diving companies. Um, so we are in contact with the three, dive, three main diving companies in, in, at the port of, of Long Beach. Um, so it's to inspect the hull. So it's inspections that are already performed on ships every six months. Um, but these companies would rather use an automated system rather than using divers because it's, it takes a lot of time to inspect the hull. And that's not how they actually generate revenue. They generate revenue by... Um, like work of repairs and, and cleaning. Um, and in after this phase, we see um, interest by performance managers at coating and shipping companies. And here it's a solution, the product will be a bit different because their need is more to get visual data at higher frequency than what is possible today. And today with divers, it's not possible to send divers every time a a ship gets into a port uh, to get the data on your hull. But if you have an automated robotic system, then um, there is a new possibility to, to get this data easily without adding burdens on, on the ship operation and therefore then improve uh, the coatings or improve um, the hull management. Yeah, I'd say uh, most of our, our clients are going to be either commercial or military, U.S. or international. Uh, we will have both in, the, in, that, in those options. Obviously, the ones I just presented are an international, uh, mostly military and government uh, you know, clients. But we've obviously done a lot of stuff in disaster relief, a lot of stuff in uh, the civil world for commercial applications, oil and gas rigs, methane sensing, that type of stuff as well. Uh, but uh, so we, you know, as everyone says, our man systems have a, a vast industry and can and can handle a lot. And so uh, we don't really focus on one small niche. We're kind of focused on the entire solution with unmanned systems for us. Uh, so our our customer base is quite large, and it makes a does make that hard sometimes. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, we've only got ten minutes left, so uh, I don't think we'll get to all these questions. So. Um... Let's, let's uh, be as, as quick as we can, we can get through more of them. So the next uh, question is with the UN Ocean Decade, what are each of you working with that will help save uh, the world's ocean? Our core competency at Mare is uh, tracking change over time and that uh, allows uh, states or countries to figure out if laws are working or not. Uh, and then also uh, climate impacts, you know, to see if you're taking the right uh, mitigation uh, path. Okay, Founce. Uh, for us um, in our um, transportation capabilities, uh, we're gonna we're helping mitigate the um, the emissions from boats, especially when you have uh, from onshore to ship deliveries. Uh, we could do that for greater and more efficient with drones than to send a ship to you know a small boat and spewing out carbon emissions to go you know deliver medications or small items small parts and things like that so uh, that's one of the ways we're helping 
Um, so I guess for us, I would pick the, um, the spread of invasive species. So it, it's seen as one of the greatest uh, threats uh, to ecosystems, to marine ecosystems. And even like states today were proactive into, into this and are, um, have enacted regulation. They don't have any good ways to enforce this regulation. And with our system, it will be for provide them with a tool to actually enforce uh, much more efficiently um, the regulation on, on, on this problem. Yeah, I'd say our, our biggest focus is going to be obviously uh, trying to save lives and protect lives as well as the environment, uh, doing landslide and seawall investigation so we can protect those who are close to the shoreline in an instance of a hurricane, as well as post hurricane disaster relief. Um, you know, when, when it hits oil rigs, when it hits houses, when it hits a lot of things, you have a lot of damages you have to go assess and making sure that that's done in a, in a pure manner while also trying to help do preventive maintenance to reduce the damages uh, from hurricanes and, and other natural disasters. Great. Okay. Um, up next is what role has AI played in your company's evolution in recent years? For me, it's been frustrating. We've tried to use um, machine learning to help us identify species and habitat, and uh, we have not cracked that nut yet, and a lot of people are working on it. Unfortunately, fish uh, move around a lot. Sponges and corals are easier because they stand still, but um, visibility changes. So we're still looking for a, a good, um, I guess, supervised autonomy in our post-processing of video data. Um, for us, we utilize AI for accuracy of landing uh, on landing stations and um, the repeatability of doing missions over and over again, the dull, the dangerous, and the dirty. So autonomy, machine learning is a part of what we do, especially in our fully integrated systems where it's end to end. All you have to do is put a, uh, a box in a, a, a package in a box that goes up to the drone, goes over and you pull it out on the other end. Uh, so our full, fully automated systems, um, the uh, uh, chain of custody as well, and those are, that's how AI works for us. Um, so for us, AI will play a role to um, analyze the data we, we obtain with, with, with our drones and be able to provide the actual intels and information that uh, our customers need. It can be to flag um, species on the herd. It can be to assess the amount of falling, um, the type of falling, etc. Yeah, I'd say for, for us, there's three major ones. The first is to, we're working on trying to find partners or software that's capable of helping us target and identify people or suspicious things such as, you know, can it tell an automatic difference between a gun and a shovel? And if so, it, will it automatically tell the person, hey, this is going to be a gun versus the person saying, hey, that looks like a gun, those types of things. Um, the other one is landing on moving things with our vehicles. Uh, so some of ours have have that capability to land on boats um, and or other uh, ground vehicles. So that's you know fine tuning that is essential. And lastly, you know one of our aircraft is a 72 foot um, wingspan, you know hail aircraft that flies for 30 days at 65,000 feet. So obviously you're going to have a lot of weather conditions getting up to atmosphere and as you're as you're flying around. So helping automate the flight scenarios. It's also very long aircraft, so you have to automate where it goes. So you have to make sure that it doesn't enter an area or a you know an air zone that's going to be uh, problemsome. So having those types of flight path scenarios where it says, "Hey, this is a red zone, don't go here," and if for some reason it's trying to go there, it automates and uh, recorrects itself. Those are kind of some of the main aspects we use. Uh, do we have time for one more question, Matt? Or absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, do you have any lessons learned for individuals or companies who may be interested in entering this space? Uh, from my standpoint, uh, it's about the people in the company. Uh, hopefully they're, I mean, what's essential I think is passion um, and the kind of the Pony Express mentality of take the job all the way to the end and, and do the handoff. Don't uh, sit there at 
501 and say, it's time for me to go home. You really want passionate people in your workforce that care about your mission. And then the other piece is always keeping an eye on your kind of business plan, how you've planned out for the next 18 months and let that help shape as many decisions you make along the way and keep course correcting and always have that plan uh, stay 18 months ahead of you. Um, yeah, I agree with Dirk, <laughs> honestly, yeah. The other thing uh, lesson learned is, especially in the uh, UAV space, is because drones are so new and it's a novel industry, when you're gonna go fly or do stuff in a new area, approach first the mayor, then have the mayor introduce you to police chief. The police chief uh, introduce you to the local leaders then the local leaders to the people. Because without those relationships, it's not gonna go anywhere and you'll be shut down before things start. Um, it's all about personal relationships, period. Doesn't matter the money, doesn't matter anything else. It's about the personal relationships you make to, to move your business forward. Um, I can add that to me, I believe um, it's very important to, to, to go out there and to test your system. You only get better every time you test your system. There is only so little you can do um, in a, in the, at the office with simulations or work at testing on workbench. Um, you, you need to find a way to, 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 to go through several cycles to test your technology and go out there and go back to, to the lab, to the office, and improve like this, but you really only get better by, by testing on the fields. I agree with, uh, with what everyone's been saying, but the only thing I would add is solve someone's problem and solve it entirely. Um, I think the the issue is people you know want to want to get into unmanned systems, and it's a cool thing to do, but you know just building another one is not necessarily the right path. Building a solution that solves the entire problem is is going to help it and and make your your team and them successful okay and then i guess this will be our last question are there any kinds of companies that your presenters are looking to partner with uh, i i would say for us we would like a, a sophisticated uh, ai partner that's our most pressing need right now um, we're always looking to partner and uh, help solve solutions. Uh, just like Phil was saying, uh, we are drone agnostic. We're help to solve problems and we're here to make you look good. Um, I mean, so far as we're partnering with, with, uh, diving companies and in general, anyone who's interested to, um, help us test this technology in the field, um, any partnership in this direction is, is very much appreciated. Payload sensors, radios, and AI um, are definitely things uh, and, and integration points for that what we're interested in. Uh, also, if you have a product that you think we, we would be able to add into our portfolio, we're interested in that as well. Oh, I'll be calling you, Phil. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> uh, awesome. Oh, and I think for all of us, it's the companies that are willing to pay us. Yeah. <laughs> we still agree there. <laughs> good one good one thank you for the levity there uh founts <laughs> looks like we're uh, drawing to a close here um really appreciate it uh thank you very much uh for being here um yeah it's uh, another successful blue tech global connect i thank everybody for attending um so uh, our next uh, BGC, Blue Tech Global Connect, will be on uh, September 15th uh, of uh, yeah, 2022. Uh, the topic is going to be offshore renewable energy, plotting a course from oil and gas into a sustainable energy future. And this will be a, a sample of a larger program that we will feature at this year's Blue Tech Week, which will take place uh, from November 14th to the 18th. Um, on behalf of TMA, I'd like to uh, thank Dirk for moderating. Well done, Dirk. Uh, I also want to thank our esteemed speakers, uh, Alex uh, Imas from uh, Berkeley Marine Robot Robotics, uh, Founts Genese, the CEO and president of USOG, and Phil Mengden, the director of business development for Swift Engineering. 
Uh, after this call, I will send out a thank you email just to make sure that we include uh, the contact info for our speakers in case you have business opportunities for them, preferably the ones that bring in revenue for them. And uh, we will also be able to, uh, or I'll also send uh, information about um, Bootech uh, Week coming up in uh, November. So again, thanks for being a part of today's uh, Bootech Global Connect, and we'll see you again on uh, September 15th. Thank you very much, everyone.